the New York Times bestselling author and internationally recognized speaker on nutrition, food safety, and public health issues. A founding member and fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, he has lectured at the Conference on World Affairs, testified before conference, before Congress, and was invited as an expert witness in the defense of Oprah Winfrey in the infamous meat defamation trial. <laughs> Dr. Gregor is a graduate of Cornell University School of Agriculture and Tufts University School of Medicine. I'm sure you know his book, How Not to Die, is a great bestseller. We still have a few copies left in the bookstore. I think we sold out of the How Not to Die cookbook. More than a thousand of his nutrition videos are available on nutritionfacts.org with new videos and articles uploaded every day. And we're so grateful to have this Q&A opportunity with Dr. Michael Greger. Thank you. How amazing to have Clapper as an opening act. What do you think? That's like I dream of the original Dr. Michael. I love him. Um, here to share the good news that we have tremendous power of our health, destiny, and longevity. The vast majority of premature death and disability is preventable with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. I hope you were able to see my presentation before. I'm so excited that they gave me this Q&A time. Looking very much forward to answering questions. And I do have an extra little um, treat for everyone. So um, basically what's happening in my life is March 1st, just about a week, I start my next book. It's a, it's a um, book on weight loss called How Not to Diet. <laughs> And, uh, and so, but to do that, so the manuscript is due on March 2019, I'll be out to December 2019, and uh, we'll be on the road in 2020, and hopefully come to your uh, hometown. Uh, but uh, to do that, to take, uh, to uh, laser focus on the book and immerse myself in the obesity literature, I had to buffer out an entire year's worth of videos for NutritionFacts.org, which is uh, the primary way by which I reach millions of people. And so, I've scripted out literally a year's worth of videos by now, before I got on the ship. And so they're all actually here. And so if anyone is interested, so I can, I'll, I'll scroll through the topics. And if anyone's interested in any particular topic, that can be your question. Oh, tell me about that. We can go through the script. So this is a preview of what's going to be like on Nutrition Facts like next February or whatever. And you'll see it here first. Nobody else will. So. Um, uh, so, um, uh, we all, uh, it's going to go pretty quick. I tried to <coughs> bump the font up um, just so it's a little easier. Um, so this is my, uh, and this is like a little behind the scenes in Nutrition Facts. Here's my 2017 articles. Um, eight, oh, you can't even read this. 82,553 articles. That's what uh, created the videos for last year. Um, uh, but here, let's get to the new ones here. All right, um, so we're actually, um, for those of you who follow the site, uh, what was the video? Well, you're on the boat, so you don't even know. Uh, what video went up today? I don't even know. I think we're up around... Alcohol. Oh, was it? Um, that was the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, newsletter that just went out. I think we're on over-treatment of uh, DCIS, stage zero breast cancer. It's actually the video came up this morning. Um, and then you'll see through the rest of the... Um, uh, Spring here, a lot more on mammograms, um, uh, cell phones, sperm counts, laptop Wi-Fi and sperm counts. Um, then on, it looks like we have chocolate, cocoa powder, bone broth, anybody's interested in apple peels. Oh, is it better to drink a little alcohol than none at all? That's the title of a video coming up, you can find out. Alzheimer's, heavy metal urine testing, more avocados, marijuana, shark cartilage supplements, fibroids, that's a good one. What about fibroids and soy? Coconut water, best food for hay fever. Benefits of kale. We probably don't need that one. I think we got that. How to access research articles for free. That's a good one. Sunflower seeds. What else? We got aloe vera gel. Um, uh, more apples, blueberries, yogurt, black salve, uh, more chia seeds, um, uh, organic meats, monk fruit as a sweetener, tea tree oil. 
That is a fungal treatment. Uh, what do we got? More aloe, brown ginger, autism, chip, um, lentils, chickpeas, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, um, coffee, how to treat jet lag, whether or not melatonin supplements are safe, chlorella detoxification, and then, um, uh, um, psoriasis. Oh, okay, well, there's so this one for elder and psoriasis. Um, uh, cannabis and cancer. Oh, macrobiotic. I thought that would be interesting. Pros and cons. Are, so I have a couple of macrobiotic diets. Just this, this shift, there's a lot of macrobiotic stuff. So if people are interested, I have to go through my mat. I reviewed the entire literature of macrobiotic diets. Um, acid blocking drugs. Um, upset tummies. Brain food. Is cheese bad for you? I think we. That's yeah, probably a, a little too elementary for this crowd, but, uh, but the cheese industry just came out with, a, with an article saying cheese is really good for you, and so I go through them and show um, what they did to arrive at that result. And that's interesting for those research geeks out there. Um, lipstick, vegetarian muscle power, strength, and endurance. Well, that's interesting for any endurance fans. Uh, talking more about coffee, light versus dark roast, kosher chicken. Eggs, breast cancer, at Oleatril. I probably have some Oleatril um, uh, videos, uh, the vitamin B17, amygdalin, apricot seeds, all that kind of stuff. Whew. Um, eating disorders, bad breath. Um, milking cancer, dental, orthorexia. That's an interesting topic. Sugar industry stuff, plastic in our oceans, microplastics, and seafood as a cancer risk. Um, toxoplasma. Ooh, how do you treat warts with well, duct tape? There's some. <laughs> Best way to cook greens, that's an interesting one. And then there's some that are, um, and again, now, unfortunately, these are not videos. The video team takes a long time to actually create the videos, but I have my scripts. And we can read through the scripts and look at uh, any particular PDFs. And then we have some more stuff colon cancer, pressure cooking. So, like an instant pot uh, video. Um, uh, cavities, flax seeds, inflammation, children's breakfast cereals. Our vegan diets always help. All right. Okay, schizophrenia. That's it. Okay, anyway, so let's, um, so, but, or any question that you had come before here, or any question on anything, let's start over here, and we'll take as many questions as we can do. And then at 7.30, I have a book signing, and we'll answer any individual specific too embarrassed to talk in front of everybody question show me your mole 730 of you <laughs> Okay, Dr. Jim, you're amazing. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Could you please fine-tune the plant-based whole food approach to address a metastatic cancer battle, including any particular foods to increase or avoid, and any references to look up? Well, that's, uh, what kind of cancer? Um, metastatic prostate cancer. Um, oh, that, wow. So that's one of the, the few rare cancers that we, it's not a rare cancer, unfortunately. One of the few rare cancers we actually have data, we actually have controlled data on dietary interventions. So the original data, Ornish published, uh, which I talked a little bit about the other day, these were early stage watching weight cancers before the radical prostatectomy, before hormonal treatments. So this is really early stage. And so you, you can recognize the difficulty of using diet to treat cancer in kind of the modern mainstream medical mindset uh, because people are typically on conventional therapy like chemo um, and radiation. And so you don't know, oh, it, and you put people on a diet. You don't know, well, was it the chemo that helped or was it the diet that helped? And there's too many variables. It's hard to, right? And so that's why in this early, that's why I was so excited to do this early watching watch weight stage cancer, where you weren't doing anything for these people, just waiting to see their PSA level, um, it was kind of a cancer biomarker, go up. And so look, if you're not going to do anything, you might as well try diet. That's what Ornish did for the first time, showed that through a plant-based diet lifestyle program, first time ever, a reversal of cancer progression. Very exciting, but that's not even the question. What, there's another scenario. <laughs> There's another scenario by which diet can be used to treat cancer, and that's at the other end of the spectrum. After the surgery failed, after the hormonal treatments failed, and we have metastatic disease um, spread to the bones, all sorts of, uh, of areas within the body, and then the medical community gives up, 
Um, and says nothing else we can do. And aha, here we go. Nothing else you can do. And so, hey, if you're not going to do anything else, might as well give a dying try. And so that's what was done with prostate cancer specifically. Um, and I have videos going up. That was part of the game in 2000. Um, uh, so I have two videos on the website right now already up. In fact, if we had good Wi-Fi on the ship, we can stream them right now. Um, but, uh, and it's um, uh, treating prostate cancer with diet. I think that's one of them. It's a whole series where they used whole food supplements, where they used lycopene, where they used tomato sauce, where they used all sorts of things um, with these um, end stage cancer group. And so I would point you to those videos just to save time um, for everybody. But I do have it. So they actually rent, so they took these people randomized to different diets and see who lived longer um, and whose disease um, slowed, etc. Check out those videos. I was very excited to find that whole body of literature. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Um, a year ago, you told me about what I should do about my breast cancer, and now I'm 15 months free, and my self counts going down. So thank you for that. Um, my question is: um, My partner has really bad psoriasis. We're vegan in our house. We don't do dairy. We're very low oil, and nothing seems to help. We've done juicing, fasting. Anything that we can think of. So if you could talk about anything that would help, that would be greatly appreciated. So I think I have one video on psoriatic arthritis, but I did see one in here. Let's peek. Should we peek at our first um, future video on psoriasis? And what's funny is I'm going to be just as surprised as everybody else because I did all these and it's, you know I, then I just kind of brain dumped them and I don't even remember what the conclusion was. So let's find out. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, that's funny. I even recorded the bit, the audio already, obviously, so we could hear me narrate it. But okay. Um, so let me bump up the uh, the. Uh, let's see, is any of this going to be readable? Uh, let's see how big we can get. Again, here's a little behind the scenes. So as you can see, this is my annotation of the video, people. 54 GQ. What does that mean? That means you take the PDF number 54 and you get the gene, the green quote. So let's go 54. Green quote, there it is. Green quote. Okay. Um, we, we can we can yeah, anyway. So now I like show the green quote and then I narrate blah blah blah. Okay, anyway, that's just how it works. But let's see what it actually says. Psoriasis, chronic inflammatory skin disease. You already knew that. Um, let's see, all right, one of the most frequent causes of chronic skin disease, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of drugs, ooh, and all right. Uh, some of which cost more than $100,000 a year. Now, there are cheaper drugs, and of course, here's all the PDFs where I show all this behind my narration, but we don't need to see that. Cheap drugs like cyclosporin, but carries long-term risk of kidney damage, hypertension, malignancies. The drug can cause cancer. That's not good. Kidney toxicity, more than 50% of patients treated long-term, um, up to 42 times the rate of cancer on this drug, um, and doesn't even work that well. Kidney disease debate, a little more than half of patients over a four-month period. There's got to be another way. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, can you read this? I don't know. Anyway, I need to hear these. Yeah, in the future, I could, we could skip to the end, or but all right, let's just see. Right. Now I'm getting excited. Okay, what about plants? It shows 56, which is presumably it's something to tell. But anyway, topical, topical botanical agents for treatment of psoriasis. That must be the the name probably of PDF 56. Anyway, well, aloe vera gel said to possess anti-inflammatory, anti-itching, and wound healing properties. Yeah, but as I described before in my video. Is how effective for blood pressure, inflammatory bowel, wound healing, and burns. When it was put to the test, it actually made things worse for wound healing. <gasps> um, and we could go through that data and show all the graphs and, and the horrible bones if anyone's interested. Anyway, but um, so and the exploitation of uh, aloe preparation becoming too often by misinformation, exaggerated claims. But there is impressive evidence. Um, for example, the test is anti-inflammatory properties. It was tested head to head against steroids against mustard gas exposure. Oh, that's wacky. 
Anyway, uh, mustard gas, popular chemical warfare agent, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But it was recently used in the Iran-Iraq war, 100,000 exposed, still suffering long-term complications. Even decades later after a gas attack, 70 to 90 percent of these soldiers suffering. And so, um, I'm skipping down a little bit. How about trying something like aloe vera because all these other agents failed miserably? Um, so they took 67 chemical warfare injured vets, randomized to aloe vera or placebo, and and the menthol. And said, oh, let's bring up this. Let me just bring up the study real quick. 53. Here's the study. Oh. E efficacy of aloe vera, vera gel versus steroids, head to head, for uh, mustard gas exposure. And by the end of the month, let's study aloe vera. Sure, 83% of patients wow. compared to a placebo cure rate less than 10%. Right? 83% versus 10%. Um, which, oh, did we already go on to the Oh, I'm sorry, now we're on against psoriasis. So work for uh, work for mustard gas. What about psoriasis? So this is the mustard the psoriasis um, experiment. That was the 80. Here it is. Management of psoriasis with aloe vera. And 83% cured uh, versus 10% significant clearing of psoriatic black skin lesions. Ta da Ah, but that was just compared to placebo. What about, um, how about compared to steroids? Ooh, PDF 61. Da -da. Da -da okay, so what about aloe versus steroids for psoriasis? And drum roll, please. <laughs> Well, aloe vera was found to be more effective than the drugs in reducing clinical symptoms. Oh, like, take this nasty belly button. F2A, F2A, F2A. There we go, nasty belly button. <laughs> take this nasty belly button. Okay, and then, well, what, what, what do we do with the nasty belly button? And, oh, here we go. And then here's after with a little aloe vera gel. Woo! Uh, oh, and 62, F2, 62, 62, oh, no, we gotta get 62. Here's more beautiful before and after picture. <laughs> Double blind, placebo control study, the aloe vera gel, for psoriasis, where's more beautiful? I don't see more beautiful before and after pictures. All right, I'm sorry. I'm looking for, I'm looking for pretty pictures. Um, 62, F2, anyway. Um, uh, okay, double blind, blah, blah, blah. Uh, aloe vera gel, 70% of aloe got better. Oh, well, wait a second. 80% of placebo treatment um, improved. The placebo beat out aloe, and why? Ah, because the placebo was made out of xanthan gum, and they thought, hey, maybe xanthan gum works too. All in all, all the results, put all the studies together, Effectiveness of aloe vera gel for psoriasis contradictory, but applying skin to pure sake, so figure out why not give it a try. <sighs> That's the conclusion with aloe vera and psoriasis. Give it a try is the answer. That probably took way too long. But anyway, I just give you a sense of what we can do if we go into it. It's so easy to poison me. Just give me something green and I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Greger. I really appreciate the opportunity to ask this question. Um, I had a coronary bypass six and a half years ago and changed to a plant-based diet six years ago. I have been 100% 100% compliant with the diet for those six years. And um, what's happened is once I got off the medications, now like a few years later, my blood pressure's gone up and my cholesterol, they want it down under 150, and I just think I produce so much that even on the you know, perfect diet, it's, um, it's still there. They want it under 150, and I've got the lowest I've ever had in my life is 176, and that's where I am now. But I'm, I'm trying the, am uh, the amlo powder and the, you know, the daily dozen and whatever. Do you have any other suggestions? Yeah, thank you so much. So, you know, it's about, so even though the average whole food plant-based cholesterol comes out, um, the bell curve comes out about 145, right? Half or better, half or worse. <coughs> so you may fall on farther out on the bell curve, just like the average blood pressure for people eating healthy plant-based diets is this perfect 110 over 65, absolutely perfect, right? That's the median right in the middle, and there's half on one side, half on the other side. So that's why the book, How Not to Die, every chapter wasn't just Whole food blend based, duh, right? A very skinny book. 
It's like, well, wait a second, if that doesn't work, then what do you do next? So, for example, for hypertension, open blood base, and if that doesn't work, then you do the flaxseed. Then you do the hibiscus tea, right? So there were, you know, uh, it's um, five tea bags worth of hibiscus tea in two cups every morning before breakfast was what was used in the study. There's a lot, very strong hibiscus tea spread out throughout the day. And the flaxseed study, it was more than, so the data doesn't just says one tablespoon of ground flaxseed. So that's for the lignans, and anti cancer compounds. But specifically for treatment of hypertension, a few tablespoons, I'd have to, Oh, crack open the book. They have a tissue we can we can open it up and we can see. Okay, and then in terms of cholesterol reduction, um, once you already move, once you're eating all food blood base, you're moving the three things that increase cholesterol. One, which is uh, saturated fat, two, trans fats, hydrogen, those on junk food, and three, dietary cholesterol. You get those out of your diet. And for most people, all oh, drops down perfect. If that's not, then you have to start adding things to your diet to actively pull cholesterol from your body, and that's where uh, you know Jenkins' kind of portfolio diet comes in. David Jenkins, University of Toronto guy, came up with the glycemic index. He pulled together, he's like, well, look, he found different foods that bring down cholesterol via different mechanisms. So he made kind of this portfolio of different foods to add to one's daily diet. So for example, slimy foods every day, okra, oatmeal, eggplant, all that soluble fiber brings it down. Nuts every day, soy every day, goes through the list. So I encourage you, Check out Portfolio Diet, I have videos on it. Um, and again, so now you've already got rid of all the stuff that's increasing it, but your liver um, is uh, not getting the message and pumping out too much cholesterol, or actually not necessarily pumping out too much, not getting rid of it fast enough. That's typically the genetic differences. Um, but we can help that um, with all bunch of things by adding additional foods and we should be able to get you down. But absolutely, I love your doctor's recommendation for a total under 150, or even more importantly, get that LDL you're really concerned about down, you know, 50, 60, 70. Okay. Thanks, thanks. Great. Hey, Dr. Greger, we'll tip that you and I are born the same day, same year, so I think that's kind of cute. No way! <laughs> uh, Happy birthday last year! Happy birthday, year. 45. <laughs> okay. um, what is the most stable, B, uh, what is the best B12? I keep hearing either it's methyl or cyano. I hear cyano is best because it's most stable and most researched. Is that the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, yeah, on the note. So cyanocobalamin is preferable because it's stable, shelf stable. Um, and so um, that's why, so for example, in these small studies where you give um, uh, vegans who are being told fishing, you give them methylcobalamin, you have to give these massive doses, like 1,000 micrograms a day, um, because who knows what's in each particular batch, in each particular bottle, and even then, some of their levels don't go up, meaning it just must not have been any in that particular batch. Uh, but cyanocobalamin, the reason that they complex it like that is to make it shelf stable. Um, and um, it happens to be the cheapest, and that's where we have this massive research base where we take hundreds of vegans, and all, and without exception, you give enough cyanocobalamin, all the B12 comes up. And because it's so critically important, not something you mess around with, we all need a regular, reliable source of vitamin B12. I recommend you know, 2,500 micrograms of cyanocobalamin once a week. All the you know, B12 you need, less than five bucks a year, and you're all set. And now, there's vitamin B12 toothpaste. You hear about this? There's this is great group in uh, Germany called ProBed. Um, and they're like, hey, some vegans just don't like taking pills. They're just so anti, right? And so they don't want to take vitamin B12 pills. And so they designed, so this veg group designed a vitamin B12 toothpaste. And of course, it's bright pink because of the cobalt in, in B12. Um, <laughs> And so it's pretty. And, and then they got, then they published a study in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, one of our most prestigious uh, nutrition journals, where they took vegans and had them brush. Uh, and they're spitting out the toothpaste, but they just it's absorbed like through your gums, just having that much in your mouth. And they actually brought everyone's levels up. So if you really don't like taking pills, you can go to Germany and buy some toothpaste. They don't sell it. Yeah. Hi. Um, 11 years ago, my granddaughter was diagnosed with celiac because for she had been put on three months of antibiotics. She ended up with diarrhea. No big duh for me, but her doctor decided she was a celiac with no evidence other than the fact that her mother was. Okay. Now, 11 years later, no, she's not a celiac. Now she has Crohn's disease. But there's no evidence, even the biopsies don't show Crohn's disease, but they've decided this is what she needs to do. And 
we need to do something. So, yeah, no, so you should never, I mean, so celiac disease, um, there's all sorts of uh, alternative doctors or quote unquote doctors that will do blood tests and things and claim people are celiac disease and then sell you the supplements that will take care of it, of course. Um, but there really is a, only one kind of gold standard, and that is this, you do this uh, small intestine, do this tissue biopsy, and without that, you really can't tell whether you have celiac or not. She's naming it. Right, and so it's important to find that out, because people who really do have celiac disease have to stay away from gluten, um, like the plague. It's not something to mess around with, otherwise it's short in your lifespan, all sorts of things. Okay, now Crohn's disease, I'm also typically diagnosed by actually getting um, uh, at least visualized in the tissue, or um, uh, uh, getting some sense of what's going on. So presumably, I don't know. I mean, so, you, right, I mean, you, you, um, you get uh, second opinions, third opinions, fourth opinions, so you make sure you have it now, third opinions. Okay, so, so what, I mean, so if it was Crohn's disease, the most powerful intervention ever designed, the medical armamentarium, what is it? Plant-based diet, um, all right? I have a video about that, I'm treating Crohn's with diet, this Japanese group, the best relapse-free rate ever for any intervention. Um, same thing with multiple sclerosis, another autoimmune disease, the most powerful prevention ever devised by humanity with the swank diet, um, and so very effective for autoimmune disease, but if you don't have an autoimmune disease, uh, then uh, that, that may not be effective. So what, what symptoms are, why well, is this? For, she's had diarrhea for 11 years. Oh, for so chronic diarrhea. I mean, so there's a whole, there's a whole different, what's well, called differential diagnosis. You go through and you test and tell them, um, for a chronic diarrhea, which tends to be kind of three weeks. So, like at 21 days, you're like, all right, something fishy is going on. And so, you know, you can do what's going on. You look for, for, for parasites, you know, particularly if they've traveled to someplace exotic. Um, and you kind of go through the list and you, and you just kind of scratch them all out. You don't just assume they have a particular disease and treat them like that um, because they could have something that's treatable um, that you're missing. Well, she's on a medication they're injecting now, and it's not doing any good, and we're just not ready to ring some doctors next. Ring some doctors next. <laughs> do not ring doctors next. Compassion. We can do it. If you can get compassion for the doctors, you can get compassion for him. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Gregor, needless to say, I love you, we all love you. Okay, let's get that out of the way. <laughs> so is there anything that could be done for calcification in arteries, once we already have it? This is for my mom. Now, she's been on a whole food diet for many, many years, no junk whatsoever. So is she still okay if there is adequate blood flow? Yeah, so, so, yeah. so calcifications are evidence of, of, of kind of... Uh, old inflammation, it's actually kind of your body's way to kind of stabilize plaque. So basically it shows that you have um, long-standing um, uh, heart disease. It doesn't, it isn't necessarily an indicator of current risk. Um, and so if you had, you know, horrible diet and horrible heart disease and then you change your diet, you'd still have evidence of that calcium. Um, and the calcium isn't going to go anywhere, but it doesn't matter because that's not what we're worried about. We're worrying about active um, uh, uh, plaques that are that are unstable and could uh, lead to heart uh, um, uh, attacks, etc. And so, so it, it, it's like it's like treating the consequence rather than the cause, right? You don't have to worry about the, uh, the, the getting calcium out of the arteries. That's actually good. And the, the body's trying to kind of lock that down. Um, what we need to do is make sure that she's currently on a whole food plant-based diet, lots of greens, lots of nitrates, improving um, artery function, um, and so the calcium score isn't necessarily um, indicative of her current risk if indeed she is doing everything right now. Uh, although Joe Kahn is like a, um, a calcium score uh, uh, expert, and may have, uh, if you have kind of specific numbers in um, a report you can show him, he'd probably be the best uh, advice in terms of what means. And he's on the ship somewhere. And he's in Detroit, so how bad can he be? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gregor, for the opportunity to ask questions. Sure. I would like to know if a broken neck resulting in nerve damage. The broken neck was 1996. The person is not 
paralyzed, but lives with chronic pain, and many other issues like cannot take a bath because it hurts, and bowel issues, either constipation, doctors put them on like Mylanta or Maalox, um, and high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, which those I know aren't necessarily related to nerve damage, but can the nerve damage be reversed or helped with whole foods, plant-based nutrition? There's one way to find out. <laughs> yeah, but she has to be cooperative, doesn't she? I have to have evidence to support her. Okay, okay, so, I mean, but the most likely reason that this person will die is probably heart disease like everybody else, particularly if she already has these risk factors. So even, so just because she wants to continue to exist on this planet, she should be healthy, and then can see if indeed, like in the case of diabetic neuropathy, um, there's this remar there's evidence of remarkable regression, reversal, um, putting people on a plant-based diet. Whether or not she will experience that same benefit, um, we don't, I mean, we won't know, but, I mean, if only there was something that not only didn't have bad, good side effects, also probably save her life in the meanwhile, then absolutely do it. But I mean, bring up a good point, you can still get hit by a bus, everyone, so still eat healthy, but also seat belts, bike, helmets, and all that stuff. All right, go ahead. Hi, can Whole Foods help reverse cataracts? Oh, that wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> so the, the the question was, can a can, uh, can healthy diet reverse cataracts? Well, we, the, the evidence we have this beautiful evidence. In fact, um, uh, I think last year at this uh, I gave a talk that included some, the the cataract data showed this remarkable drop in risk of getting cataracts in the first place. Dropping, I forget, way down, but there was a stepwise drop. You know, comparing meat eaters to the so-called flexitarians, to pesco vegetarian, to no meat except fish, to lacto ovos, to vegan, and this stepwise drop in cataracts risk as one gets more and more plant-based. But the question is, if you already do have them, what can you do? You call a surgeon. Right, so, um, so, uh, so cataract surgery is actually very, I mean, of all surgeries, right, um, it's uh, very low risk and, uh, and you know, can, can serve remarkable improvement. Oh, but there's very, and so, uh, I'm trying to think, I think I have a video about that. The reason we get cataracts is uh, actually our body's um, protection against these blue rays from the sun, um, this yellowing of our, it actually protects our retina. Um, and so we can, so instead of getting cataracts, what we can do is eat lots of lutein and zeaxanthin. These are these wonderful green, yellow greens compounds. They're yellow compounds, but found in dark leafy vegetables like spinach. Um, and then, and, and our body sucks it up and directs it straight to the retina and protects it its own kind of internal sunscreen. Then our body doesn't need to make cataracts because we're already protected. And that's why we think this is a nice stepwise drop in risk. The more plants we get into our diet. Thank you for doing what you do. You're welcome. Are there any organizations that you're aware of who would be interested in doing research on my whole food plant-based body after death? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, um, uh, it's gonna be a while. <laughs> I hope so. But, uh, so uh, um, not that I know of. I don't know of anyone that's collecting. Wouldn't that be nice? So like Nathan Pritikins, for example, actually has hit, had his autopsy published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So he had this horrible um, heart disease, um, uh, and he was going to drop that in a moment, reverse his own heart disease after doing research. He was an engineer, and then shared that with everyone else, like my grandma and so many others. And okay, right? And so but then when he died, because we had this documentation of this ravaging heart disease, um, uh, and this was before we had nice angiograms, we could actually visualize it. And so on autopsy, he was, he was described as he had um, coronary arteries at Lionel as a teenager, right? Completely clear, beautiful, very nice to see. Uh, but again, a little too late, we like to get Anyway, uh, but um, uh, not that I know of. I mean, so when, you, when people quote unquote donate their body to science, typically what happens is they are um, offering their body for cadaver lab. Um, and so it's for medical students to learn anatomy, basically. Um, it sounds much more highfalutin than 
right? I mean, so they're, they're typically not, although certainly there's um, body tissues that they can use, for example, um, uh, you know, uh, transplanted. Um, uh, and so um, we should all sign up for organ donors, make sure it should be by default, I wish, but um, when you get your new driver's license or something, you sign up with an organ donor. Um, and boy, are they lucky for your <laughs> organs. Um, but, uh, but beyond that, I don't know if any research organizations, everybody who does know, let me know though, and I could, I could let people know about it. That would be interesting. Yeah. I, if we bring meat into the home, it can change our microbiome. Should we be concerned about bringing in raw meat for our pet dogs, and what could we do about it? Yeah, particularly chicken. So, you know, if you have a roommate, whose chicken is dripping on your broccoli in the fridge, right? You're, at, you're in fact, at more risk. Why? Because they're at least going to cook their chicken, right? Um, whereas your broccoli may, you know, get a light stir fry, just be raw in the salad, it can be even worse, right? Um, and so I think I, uh, you know, in this uh, presentation I gave a day or two ago, you know, talked about how just bringing in a fresh approach chicken in the household, you just, it gets everywhere throughout the kitchen, on the countertop, blah, blah, blah. Um, even if you have people spritzing bleach around the house, I mean, the best way to guarantee you're not going to affect yourself or your family is not bringing it home in the first place. Um, so pre-cooked, so if you're going to have you know, meat products in terms of food safety, pre-cooked meat products only in your household. Um, and so I would be very careful about handling raw meat for one's pets. So, but it's, you know, hand hygiene stuff, making sure you're washing hands, wear gloves, you can and there's different risks for different, you know, so for pork, you worry about your simian, if you're chicken, you worry about Campylobacter and salmonella. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's dangerous. You've got to handle it like toxic waste. Like literally, you should, you should all have those like bio suits, you know? Um, but no, I mean, it's just very careful. Anything that touches anything, you want to make sure it's bringing it, coming back, and then. Or, you, I mean, and there's, and there's like veg dog, veggie dog, and you know, other, I mean, you, could, you don't have to do the meat all? Yeah. Uh, experience, uh, um, relative, and a bad experience with uh, kidney stones. Ah, so, uh, okay. for diagnosis, he diagnosed, he was told to eliminate uh, dark leafy greens from his diet. Oh, does that sound <laughs> right to you? That does not sound right to me, but it depends what kind of kidney stones they have. So, there's different kinds of kidney stones. And so that's why they actually try to strain them out and see what they are so they can actually type them. So the most common types of kidney stones um, are dark green leafy vegetables. Um, so they're worried about oxalate, these oxalates. There's some high oxalate to greens, uh, which is beet grains, Swiss chard, and spinach, which is why they're so kind of stingy with their calcium. And so uh, we should uh, have a preference for low oxalate greens, which is all the other greens, just because uh, we have a little better mineral absorption, even though those are wonderful greens. Uh, but for someone who uh, needs to reduce our oxalates, for example, they have specific like kidney stones or uh, uh, two other kind of medical conditions, then they would just switch their greens to, uh, to different kinds of greens. But the most critical factor would be um, is sodium and animal protein. I've got some amazing videos about uh, what you can do. In fact, if you have a uric acid, so you actually dissolve the stone away just with dye. And that involves alkalizing urine. What do you do with that? Greens. Greens are the most alkalizing food. Alkalizing urine, you actually dissolve the stone away, and so now you need to go in there and uh, um, break it up. So you just type in kidney stones, nutrition facts, and pull all those up. Hi, Dr. Greger. Thank, thank you for everything that you do. Um, my question is pretty much about the childhood. I grew up with a standard American diet until about a year and a half ago. Um, Notice when I was a child, I was getting ready for wisdom teeth surgery, um, my clotting time was horrible, about 17 to 20 minutes horrible. Um, turning plant-based, obvi obviously it's gotten better. What is the difference from standard American diet, anemia, hemophiliac versus plant-based and seeing a difference in clotting time? Okay, so there's a number of different, so there's a number of different clotting factors, a number of different things that go into um, uh, you know, uh, preventing your blood from getting too thin. Um, and so one is, uh, there's all sorts of kind of <coughs> factors and there's little platelets in your blood. There's a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of genetic conditions, um, acquired conditions that can interfere with different pathways. Um, uh, probably the, uh, uh, so, uh, they, they, you know, there's a, that's why vitamin K is critical in uh, one particular clotting pathway. Where is vitamin K bound? Dark and leafy vegetables. So if all of a sudden goes, someone goes from standard American diet to, uh, 
um, uh, to a healthy diet, they might be getting some more vitamin K, if that's ever um, an issue for them. Um, but um, but uh, so the, the problem is we don't want our blood clot too much because actually clotting diseases are the number one and the four cause of death, heart attacks and strokes, clotting up. And so we don't we want our uh, we want our blood to be just perfect in terms of not too thin, right? Because we don't want to um, uh, you know get a hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding in the brain or something. We don't want it to clot to be too uh, into a highly coagulable state. Um, and how do we do that? We eat plant based. So when you look at blood, so-called biology, um, I've got a bunch of videos on that. I had some more coming out um, in terms of uh, getting that kind of perfect, you know, uh, balance, um, the best across measures to those people um, eating plant-based diets, and maybe because of just getting kind of the right nutrients and not getting, you know, too much, you know, sodium saturated fat things that kind of slow up the blood and, and decrease uh, um, so a lot of times. Yeah, absolutely. And same thing with immune function, right? If you think about it, I mean, our, our, we are a few minutes away from death, from, you know, anaphylactic shock for people that have, you know, serious um, uh, food allergies. That's your immune system. That's your immune system. So violently reacting to that, you know, a peanut allergy, whatever. Um, but that's how powerful our immune system is. Um, and so we don't want that. I mean, so a lot of these autoimmune, allergic diseases, seasonal Think this is an overactive immune system, um, and so when we think of like immune boosting foods, with some people that we don't want that immune boost, they're already a little too highly keyed up. On the other hand, immune system is critical for fighting off infections, um, uh, killing out butter, budding cancer tumors, um, uh, and so what we want is that perfect golden zone in the middle where we don't have the autoimmune diseases um, uh, and uh, we don't have the inflammation. Um, and uh, but we're not, uh, um, uh, but we're also protected against, you know, things like pneumonia, leading cause of death. I'm protected from cancer, so that's where we can get with the plant-based diet. Best of both worlds. Yes. I'm a mostly whole foods vegan, and I have Crohn's disease, not celiac. And so it was tested. Yeah. And at this point, I've heard conflicting information on whether or not people with IBD should eat bread at all. Mm -hmm. um, even Ezekiel or Alvarado Street or something like that, yeah. or flowers in general, could you please clarify? Oh, yeah, so it's not flowers, it's the yeast. So bakers, brewers, and nutritional yeast. So there are two groups of individuals who I encourage people to stay away from nutritional yeast. One, people with Crohn's disease. Two, people with something called hydradenitis separativa, which is uh, uh, another uh, kind of autoimmune disease ha having to do with one's armpits as opposed to one's small intestine. Um, and so I have a, a, a four video series talking about this really remarkable data. And then, of course, the gold standard where you put it to the test. You can um, do these uh, double blinded placebo challenge tests where you give people, you know, a little, uh, you know, nutritional yeast in the capsule versus, you know, rice flour, some kind of placebo. And you can get people to flare and unflare. Um, uh, and so, um, and so. My, the conclusion of my video series is like, look, these people with those two conditions should not go out of the way to add yeast to their diet. Um, and so, you know, let's, you know, they shouldn't be eating nutrition yeast. I have a lot, tons of videos on the benefits of nutrition yeast. Unfortunately, that cannot be enjoyed by those with those two conditions. Um, uh, but, um, but that would be a next logical step. Is, well, look, if yeast is so bad, then maybe I shouldn't be drinking beer, and maybe I shouldn't be eating a leaven of bread. And so, if you are, and so basically, what I what I've told my Crohn's patients, first of all, absolutely no nutritional yeast. Half of them don't listen to me. Um, and uh, and the other thing is, if they're continuing to if they're um, continuing to experience flares um, or issues, then to go that next step. But if you are in remission, haven't had a problem, my recommendation would just not add more. Um, but if you're still having problems, yes, I would cut out all forms of yeast because it's your body attacking this special fiber called beta glucan found within um, uh, within uh, within yeast um, for people who are predisposed. It's actually really good news for people with um, these conditions because uh, so many people can actually control their disease by just these dietary tweaks. Yeah. Okay, I was on the sad for. 60 plus years, and you're an Episcopalian. I'm sorry, you were so sad. Yeah. Oh, I was like on scene. You were at the beach? I was on scene too. Yeah. All right. Uh, but uh, three or so years ago, I had a TIA. 
and uh, my uh, cholesterol was uh, good. Uh, my blood pressure was uh, fair, uh, but nonetheless, I was, the neurologist put me on uh, Lipitor, Plavix, and uh, Cosa. And I'm thinking I would like to get off some or all of those, and uh, do you think that's a good idea? Yes, yeah, so do you remember what oh, and, and, I'm yeah. sorry, uh, two years ago we became uh, plant-based, and uh, been fairly compliant, and after this cruise, I'm going to be obsessively compliant. There you go! Hey, you are the that's that. I mean, some people can get away with eating garbage once one. They have whatever, you know, genetic makeup. But they get away, they can have gorgeous cholesterol and still eat coconut oil and things like that. That would ordinarily raise people's cholesterol. But if someone who's already eating pretty healthy already, has high blood pressure off drugs, has high cholesterol off drugs, then you have to it's absolutely, like you know, no added salt and whole food, plant based, no junk. Um, and you should be able to um, uh, get off the stat and get off the uh, high blood pressure medication. In fact, you should do it along with your, under doctor's supervision, so you make sure you're not over medicated. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so it, I mean, just it, it is no. Um, you know, people think, oh, I'm eating plant-based, so I don't have to worry about these diseases anymore. Well, the reason, I mean, the plant-based, you know, fixes the, the risk factors. We still have to get those risk factors checked just because the average, you know, open plant-based person has this perfect cholesterol, perfect blood pressure, doesn't mean that everybody does, and you may have to go that one extra step. So, but absolutely, that, you, you gave yourself the advice that I would have given you is that it's particularly important. You are at particularly high risk already having evidence of the disease um and so you just have to you just have to yeah take and you can watch your numbers and see what happens great hi thank you so much for the on the 12 and thank you so much for the app oh the it's app so easy ah anybody know the app Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen free app. I mean, it's free, of course. iPhone and Android. You can follow along. All the servings of all the foods. I encourage you to get in your daily diet. You click off the boxes, and then you track your progress and and see how bad you thought your diet was good. And you're like, oh, I didn't get three servings of legumes in today. Ah, I'm so behind. Yes. Yeah. Now the question that probably is: Should we cook the greens? Eat them raw. Ooh. So cook greens or eat them raw. You should eat greens in whichever way gets you to eat more of them, right? <laughs> like eating raw, eat them raw. You like cooking with, with the exception of deep fry. So tempura just been right. So deep fry, that's actually bad. But any other way, I mean, and so, and so they're a little different. So if you came to me and said, I like cooked and raw greens identically well, right? Then I'll tell me, then, there's all sorts of really cool data where we can go say, oh, well, there's different kinds of cooking for different kinds of greens, that's different kind of things. And then we can blend the greens, we can do all sorts of things we can do to maximize it. But basically, we're talking about 10, 20%, right? Oh, so if you steam this much as opposed to this much, you can get this um, little boost of detriment. But that's completely overwhelmed by quantity. So if all of a sudden, if you twice as much of one form of greens than another, and like, oh, I love my collard greens boiled, you say, oh, Boiling greens, think of all the nutrition you're, yeah, but if you love boiled collard greens and you're going to sit down to a pound of day of boiled collard greens and raw collard greens, you're like, okay, I'll nibble a leaf or something, but forget it, then boil those collard greens. Yeah. But then take that, that, all that green juice at the bottom and make some soup out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Mason may be looking for an explanation of something that happened. Yeah. All right. So mostly vegan, started three years ago. Great. Um, and three months after starting, when got my uh, annual, my cholesterol had spiked uh, 247. Whoa! For the next 18 months, it was 247, 237, 243. And after 18 months, it went to 224. <coughs> last, uh, that, and then last hours, it was 213. Oh, I'm sorry, that was in the last hours. December was 213. And uh, two weeks before I came on the boat, it was two of three. So things are going in the right direction. Why did it spike? 
And so, and, and so the cholesterol before were, I mean, so. There were uh, 2, 30, I think it was the one before that, 33. Yeah, it's yeah. always been high. It's been high, right. So I couldn't take it. Uh, right, and, to, and you, do, you have to know the LDLs, but that's what we really care about. But, but basically, they're doing the same thing as the yeah, total triglycerides. Right. Right. Triglycerides are great. Oh, I love your yeah. numbers. I love your triglycerides. Yeah. All right. So I'd like to see the trend of hydration. The first thing where you get an unusual lab test, like all of a sudden my cholesterol is high for no particular reason, is you do exactly what it sounds like you did, you get a retest, right? Because you can imagine doing all this thing, having all this psychological stress, and it's just, I mean, the, our, the, uh, the, our lab testing facility, I mean, you see this all the time. I mean, any doctor will tell you, you, know, you just get some crazy value just to retest and make sure before you start, you know, putting people on drugs or, you know, having people about the change your diet. Um, uh, but, I mean, so the most common cause of high, high cholesterol, this may not be, in your case, for people eating healthy, um, uh, and, uh, so they're eating, you know, whole food plant-based, and all of a sudden their cholesterol goes up, is they have added to their diet a plant-based source of saturated fat. So all of a sudden, they started eating coconut oil, palm kernel oil, or palm oil. So they, or they very rarely start eating junk food with hydrogen or trans fats or something. Um, and so then they're like, no, I'm totally vegan. You know, I eat a tablespoon of coconut oil a day, which raises LDL cholesterol worse than lard. Not as bad as butter, but worse than lard, coconut oil. And so they're like, I'm totally vegan. Yeah, but you're, you're eating saturated fat. It's like you're eating a tablespoon of lard. No wonder your um, cholesterol is spiking. Is that not the case? Any kind of plant-based source of shit. There's these earth rare balance. tropical oils. Earth balance. Earth balance. What's an earth balance? Anybody know? Palm oil. What does palm oil do? According to the palm oil industry, nothing. According to the science, it boosts your LDL cholesterol, which is what we care about. Get rid of your earth balance and your cholesterol is coming down. There you go. This is soft. Hello, and thank you for being here. You are welcome. <laughs> we, have a, oh, we have a whole movement that's trying to get more people to be plant-based. Uh, Mark is a physician, and you have overwhelming evidence that this is obviously the way that we need to do to bring our patients health and happiness. Um, but we have resistance from both colleagues, administration, people that are trying to deflate or diminish the message so that it's not delivered where it needs to be. Any thoughts, advice? Kidnapping and making them read your book. Ah! <laughs> okay, no bringing of necks and no kidnapping. Let's just get that straight right off the bed. Yeah. Okay. You are compassionate, and that's only for the warts, evidently. Okay, I don't know. Um, the, uh, you know, it's something really exciting, um, and ooh, I'm trying to think, I don't think it's confidential. But the, the, um, they're working on legislation. So, um, uh, thanks to the pioneering work of Neil Barnard, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, they got the, uh, the AMA, the American Medical Association, the largest professional association of physicians in the country, to come out and recommend that hospitals in their cafeteria, right, should really um, move towards plant based, definitely get rid of things like processed meat, right? Just like hospitals used to have cigarettes in their gift shop, right? Um, and they got rid of them. To their credit, they were actually leaders um, in you know, smoke-free facilities. And so they can be leaders on this as well. And we know processed meat, bacon, and hot dogs, lunch meat, et cetera, category one carcinogen. We know they are we know they cause cancer um, as much as we know that plutonium causes cancer, cigarette smoke causes cancer, and uh, and asbestos causes cancer. So no human carcinogen, yet people are sending kids to school with them. I mean, you know, they're, they're certainly in, okay, outrageous. Okay. So um, but who, I mean, what good is a guideline, a recommendation, if it's not put it so, legislation is being introduced in the state of New York that mandating hospitals follow the recommendations of the American Medical Association, right? And you know, that's one of the things I love about PCRM. This is the end game all along. So look at the AMA and say, look, here's the evidence, it's overwhelming. And look, it's just voluntary guidelines, right? You're not mandating it. So the bar is low for them to say, okay, look, the evidence is there. We'll throw you a, a bone, of, a carrot, we'll throw you a carrot. <laughs> and be like, yeah, okay. But and then, now that we have the recommendation, then we go for the real, right? Then we can go, look, lawmakers, the American Medical Association says we've got to be plant-based meals in hospitals, right? Well, you've got to listen to the AMA, right? 
And then, and so, um, and so, you know, if New York goes, then we'll have this nice domino effect. And so, um, you know, just having the science there isn't enough, has to be made in the policy. And that's one of the uh, things I love about PCRM. They're actually working at kind of the government level. So, you know, I'm, you know, I can get the information out there, but we need to put it into practice. And many of you out there are in the trenches, you know, giving people the tools, the hows to do it. Um, but we need to make it convenient, we need to make the societal shift, and that's why some of this, this work at the higher echelons is even more important. Unfortunately, work at the federal level, I believe, is stalled for a few years, but that's why we take it to local, we take it to the states, we take it to our school boards, right? All right. Thank you. Yeah. You're awesome. So, after menopause, Hot flashes, I really thought it would stop, but it never did. Have night sweats, take this on and off all day long. It's like, I thought that perhaps going plant-based would fix that. It didn't seem to make any difference. And did you try soy? A tofu. So yes. Yes. Okay, so that, I mean, so the reason why in Japan there isn't even a word for hot flash, um, it, and they don't experience it any kind of at the rates that they do here in the Western world, is because Japan has the highest soy food consumption in the world. There's these phytoestrogens in soy, um, and we have these this gorgeous data with placebo-controlled, double-blind, randomized control trial, where you basically concentrate soy in a pill, and then you give people sugar pills or that, and you can show these dramatic reductions in menopausal hot flash symptoms by giving people soy. So I encourage you to uh, ramp up your soy food consumption. Tofu is good, but better than tofu. Tempeh is actually a whole soy food. You can see the individual whole soy beans in there. So soy, I mean, so, you know, uh, you know, tofu is like the, the white bread of the soy kingdom, right? You take a whole soy bean, you remove half the minerals, half the fiber, and you're left with tofu. Now, soybeans are so incredibly healthy, you can remove half the nutrition, you still have a really healthy food, but even healthier. Something like, you know, edamame. Like, the inch of green soybeans themselves in a pot of great stuff. Love edamame. Whoa! Love so, that's it. so add that to your daily diet, not just once in a while. Daily diet, edamame, boom. So I put a little black pepper instead of salt, and all right. All right, thank Woo! you. I think I understood your, your comment a few minutes ago about the calcium heart scans. Yeah. And uh, well, I've been relying on it for the past uh, 15 years. Are you with my doctor about taking statins or not? So my score is a reasonable number, and uh, I'm not a vegan, but getting closer to the way after this trip. Uh, I have 15 years of data on the calcium heart scan, and it, you know, going up, you know, all of a sudden, it went down a year ago. Uh, so my question is, uh, can the plant-based, uh, the whole foods plant-based diet? actually cause your calcium parts score to go down. Because I was, I was told by one of the leading persons in this field that uh, you don't eliminate this stuff. Right, you would just expect it to accumulate. So that may very well be in the kind of natural variation of how it's in the skin. It's um, a 20, 25% reduction. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and Joel and I, you know, argue about the radiation exposure. And, and I think there's reason the USBSCF you, you, you didn't like that radiation. I know, I try not to fly as much as possible. Yeah. <laughs> I blow in the dark, thanks to my cosmic ray exposure um, in the airplanes. But, um, but what you can do is you can draw. So, um, so that's not how you make, um, I mean, so if you're, if you had, the, the role I can see for something like a calcium scan test, um, or even, there, there are better tests, like you can look at, uh, you can do that too. Can you think, can they, how your credit is looking? <laughs> okay, so, I mean, um, you would do those kind of tests, in my view, if you had the best possible test, you had the whole food plant based diet, this exquisite, we could not improve your diet better, but still had high cholesterol. So if your LDL was still up, despite uh, despite me locking you in a room and feeding you like the, you know the, the best diet I could come up with, then the question is: All right, you're doing everything. Your arteries are going to be have this amazing function because you're eating all these dark and leafy vegetables all the time. Should I put this person on a statin drug 
even though we've maximized lifestyle, then some of these other indicators, well, let's look at the gratis, let's see um, if there's some evidence of, of active building up of plaque despite this amazing diet. But if your LDL is in, do you have any idea? It's not that great. Well, then that's you got it. All right. So that's, that's the, why I yeah. didn't see its score from this test. So, I mean, so, but you can, within weeks of, of, of eating Swiss healthy, drop it down as low as it possibly goes. So you should, within weeks, know how low you should be able to get your cholesterol um, in general. Well, I've been told by other people on this stage so don't worry about those numbers. Oh, now see, I, now that's something I disagree. So, so someone comes to me with high LDL, I worry regardless of what they eat. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean I put them on drugs, but um, I don't think there's just some like magic, I mean, the, the data linking LDL with, you know, heart endpoints in terms of, you know, uh, revascularization, death, heart attack, etc., is so strong now um, that I would not be something I would dismiss. So why wouldn't you want to spend 200 bucks on their own to get a calcium heart screening test? Which now is part of the presidential physical. They, were, they added it when Clinton collapsed. Right, but I mean, but it, is not, it is not recommended. So the USPSCF does not recommend calcium So what? So what? We, and, and so, they and, don't and, recommend a lot of things. And why? Because the benefits don't outweigh the risks. That's why. The radiation risk? The radiation risk and the risk, right, and, and the risk of, you know, overdiagnosis, where you actually treat something, you put a stent in somebody that you don't need to put a stent on. PSA numbers, not measuring every second. I yeah. wouldn't recommend PSA testing. Anything. I know, I know. Right? Because we're going to all this unnecessary surgery. We're not perfect either, so, okay. Yes. Thank you for being such a great inspiration. So, I know you don't um, like to dip your toes into the diet wars, but I have a sister, I mean, from your website, it seems like you don't do that very often. I have a sister who decided for the sake of a few pounds, to lose a few pounds, she went on the high fat ketogenic diet. Yeah. I'm afraid for her. I mean, it just, everything I've learned is that <coughs> high fat gets into your muscles and, Bad. Yeah. and all that. So, you know, what are the risks of that? Yeah, so I actually have a, um, that is what was I, I was working on when uh, signing the book contract. So I have a, a series of, um, i show you, Let's see. you want to see ketogenic? I've got ketogenic. Um, so let's, let's load my ketogenic file here, keto, H-I-J-K, there we go. So how are we here? Um, this is... Um, so these are this is these are the best uh, you know I don't know thousands of articles on ketogenic diets, um, and let's see some weight loss. So uh, so basically these are unfortunately just compilations of my notes at this point, um, which you know really doesn't help me because I so I have to go through and synthesize the data. But that's where I was when all of a sudden I had to um, buffer out a year's worth of video. So I had to stop my research there. Um, uh, uh, and so I'm into intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets, water-only fasting, all these things, they all kind of tie together. But, I mean, the bottom line is uh, ketogenic diet is like the worst possible, I mean, you can imagine, it's just the worst possible diet you can imagine for long-term health and longevity. Um, and uh, and uh, in the meanwhile, is there a good resource? Um, Katz is great. So David Katz at uh, Yale Prevention Research Center uh, does blogs on the ketogenic diet all the time. So the U.S. News and World Report just came out with their, you know, best diets of 2018, you know, issue. Um, and the key, and they, they have like 30 diets, half of which I didn't even heard of, right? Um, and the last one, so like 30, the, the last one is ketogenic diet. Like the unhealthiest possible diet. Why is on the list? Um, 30, yeah. I mean, until you can put it that, I don't know if that might, and so it's like basically every, you know, diet expert agreed, like that's just the worst of the worst, and maybe that would like, oh, maybe that would wake her up a little bit, until nutrition facts videos come up, and then we got the signs right there in front of me. Yeah, just a simple question. I think I heard the other day from um, one of the speakers in Paxos Street that grilling or cooking seafood yes. causes even more of those carcinogens than doing that with beef. Did I hear oh, that right? 
Um, well, definitely yeah. with chicken. So chicken muscle creates more heterocyclic amines, these, car these cooking carcinogens, than um, beef. So, uh, but I think chicken's higher than fish. But whether fish is higher than beef, I don't know. I'd have to look. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, but uh, yeah. I wasn't sure I heard that. Right. Um, it's possible. So definitely chicken's higher than beef. Where is it? Is it chicken, fish, beef, or chicken, beef, fish? I don't know. Well, it's a, it, when you type in HCA into the nutrition space, it's a um, so, so I mean, so I mean, the, so the healthiest way to prepare meat, if you're going to eat meat, is boiling, stewing. So moist temperatures doesn't go above boiling temp. So not dry cooking, not baking, boiling, barbecuing, grilling, any of that. Um, that wow. prevents the, these excess um, carcinogens. Of course, the animal protein alone will increase the idea of do all sorts of bad things. But at least you won't get that extra um, dose of carcinogens. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Berger. Thank you for everything. Um, because 11 years ago I was diagnosed with a blood clotting disorder, factor 5, yeah. I've been on a blood thinner for yeah. 11 years. I'm presently taking 15 MGs and 10 MGs, you know, right now. I want to increase my leafy greens yeah. a lot. Yes. But it's mm. going to get to the clotting stage. Is there any other vegetables that I could eat to get the blood Oh, nutrients? I love it. Okay, so um, this is a question about something called cumin or warfarin. This is a um, a, a, a blood thinning drug that works by um, basically uh, mucking with your ability to recycle vitamin K. Um, and vitamin K helps with blood clotting, so by poisoning your vitamin K system, all of a sudden your blood thins out, which is good if, if you have a clotting disorder. Um, and so, if all of a sudden you go out and you eat a whole bunch of vitamin K, dark green leafy vegetables, then you overwhelm the drug's ability to stop your uh, uh, vitamin K, um, uh, recycling program, and then you can get you can get back to normal clotting, which would be bad for someone with a clotting disorder. And so, what doctors say is, don't eat green, don't eat dark green leafy vegetables, because they assume you've never eaten a green in your life. So, don't go out and eat a green, right? Because we'll, we'll get your drug levels um, where we want them, and then you know you never ate them, and you're never going to eat them, so just don't eat them, right? So that okay. Where what they should say is, you should eat mass amounts of dark green leafy vegetables every day for the rest of your life and titrate your drug levels to that level. Um, and so um, basically they just need to titrate, you know how much vitamin K you're getting, and titrate your drug to block just the amount you're getting. They assume you're getting none, so they put you at this low level and say don't eat any. No, greens are so incredibly healthy. So you, um, and then you just have to maintain your greens intake. And if you were for whatever reason to drop your greens intake, then you'd have to get retitrated um, and they drop them. No, so the coumadin just, I mean, so the, uh, not, well, I don't want to take too much coumadin, it's all based on the effect, and the effect is just blocking vitamin K, so you get more vitamin K, it seems like you're on a really high dose, but all you're doing is the exact same effect as if it was, you know, blocking less green, but absolutely less green, and you actually have more kind of stable, what's called, um, uh, more stable INRs on the constant green to take than if you would, you know, all of a sudden eat a little celery or something and then change your levels. Yeah, good afternoon. I was uh, quite stunned earlier this week to hear that eating a whole food plant-based diet would have a positive effect on bipolar disorder. And also I heard the word schizophrenia here, I think, today. Are there magic foods that help with that, and is there any data on that? So, um, I, there, um, I don't think there's any data on dietary interventional trials for bipolar. The only data we have for randomized controlled trials is for, major, for depression, for mood elevation, not for bipolar, but we're talking unipolar depression, not bipolar. I, we can look through very quickly, see if anything popped up. See, unfortunately, I just got up to F, see the, all these uh, gray bars? These are all the topics I covered in this next year, but the gray bars end with flax, because I go through the alphabet. And so there'll be flax videos in the next year, but there'll be no videos on any of these other topics because I wasn't able to get to it yet. But we can go to mental health and see what video, what articles. I wonder um, if there's any. Ooh, I could just search for bipolar. Right? Let me just look at these video titles in case there's some amazing video. I mean, excuse me, amazing uh, um, article that I don't know. The coffee in the front. Did you see one? Yeah. Oh, where? Where, 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 where? Uh, down, down. 
Uh, ah, you should. Yeah. You better just. Oh, died in my bullet. Oh, you chicken. Yeah. All right, died in my bullet. A few mechanisms. All right, let's look at the conclusion. The well, died in my bullet requires further attention. Or well, what does that mean? Uh, most of course, let's see if it says anything. Oh, here's some video. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's run. I'm make it turn to the right. All right, well, everyone just turn their head. Here we go. Um, so cross-sectional data, cross-sectional CA. Yeah, these are all cross-sectional data. So basically it said people need a particular guide have more or less for one or interventional trial to prove cause and effect. And let's see, the gear. So basically, um, currently studies only requires, here we go, yeah. Here's probably, this is probably the highlight I do if I was doing a video about it. Studies so only comprise cross-sectional designs, meaning to a snapshot in time study. And you can find people that need help here. So someone that told you that probably showed you had this cross-sectional study that said, look, people that eat healthier have lower rates of bipolar disease. There's two explanations for that. People that eat really healthy reduce the risk of getting bipolar, or people with bipolar eat crappy diets, right? People eat comfort foods, right? And so which came first? Was the cause effect to healthy people, the mentally healthy people eat healthier? Or does eating healthier actually lead to mental health? You don't know until so you put it to the test, do an intervention trial, you randomize people to different diets and see what happens. That's been done for depression. We can significantly elevate mood by decreasing our intake of, you know, uh, you know, uh, chicken, other meat, and eggs from this arachidonic acid. But does it help with bipolar? According to this review, which I believe is 2015, all we have is cross-sectional data, so there's no, we don't know if there's cause and effect with diet, at least as of three years ago from the study. Yeah. Hi. My question is regarding lipoma or fatty tumors. Yeah. Um, is there any information or that you might have regarding cause, uh, root cause, and yeah. non-surgical interventions? Uh, I've heard stories of perhaps apple cider vinegar <coughs> as a potential treatment, but I well, lipomas are the tumors to have. So lipomas are little, it's a little, little balls of fat that just pop up. You don't know what causes them, and the only treatment is surgical. Right? They just go in and make a little slip, pull it out, and boom, it's done. But it's all cosmetic, doesn't cause any problem. I mean, there's extraordinarily rare cases of a certain type of sarcoma that can build those tumors, but if it's just a lipoma, if it's just a, uh, an accumulation of fat tissue, you don't know what causes it, and there's no known dietary or lifestyle intervention that can affect the course, no medication. Um, all we really have are surgical options, but again, that's only cosmetic unless it's interfering with movement or something. So it's just up to you, you whether or not you want to do this very safe, simple surgery to do it or not. Yeah, sorry, there's, uh, unless, yeah, if you do a PubMed search, go to PubMed.org, the database of the largest medical library in the world, you type in your disease of interest, like lipoma and diet, and see if anything pops up. I assume nothing would, because I think you can do it right now. Um, but if something does, um, then you watch my, uh, my video on how to get all research articles for free, download it, read it, find out. If you don't understand anything, let me know, and I'd be happy to interpret it for you. And if it's something juicy, I'll do a video about it. Dr. Gregor, thank you. Uh, since I talked with you last year here, it seems my car has been a magnet for people who like to bump into the behinds of other people's cars when they're at a stop sign. Um, twice this has happened, uh, two months ago, the last one, but I was really grateful that uh, I had the CT scan because something came up, the doctors said that I had really severe ankylosing spondylitis oh, wow. and this has caused some really severe chronic pain. I mean, it, it looks like all along my spine and my hips and even up into my skull, right. there are little um, bony right. st structures that are cutting off. Uh, I'm, I'm into the G-bombs I've been into it for years. Tell me something specific, please, that you yeah. so, to dissolve that. Right. Um, there is, so there are, there are, that is one of many um, inflammatory rheumatoid diseases, right? joint diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. We have tremendous data showing that rheumatoid arthritis, with a variety of different plant-based diets, can be one of the most effective treatments ever devised. Um, and now we have osteoarthritis data, but as far as I know, there's been no dietary interventional trials on ankylosing, ankylosing spondylitis. 
But one would, because it's in the same general class, one would assume eating healthy, but you're already eating healthy. And so there hasn't, as far as I know, been any specific trials, although we can look, do a really quick search. Let me, let me just really quick see, um, open up my enclosing spondylitis folder. Uh, um, chewing gum. I have a chewing gum folder in my arthritis folder. <laughs> there we go. Enclosing spondylitis. Oh, oh, interesting. So this is, um, ah, uh, so this is a study looking at. So, for example, disease like rheumatoid arthritis are not found on um, epidemic levels in plant-based populations. And so I was very excited to find this particular study showing that even in uh, plant-based populations, there appears to be cases suggesting that diet may not play a uh, key role. Uh, one doctor mentioned that it could be because I was drinking hemp milk, soy milk, rice milk, almond milk that has calcium carbonate added. <laughs> Would that count that form of calcium black on you? No, I mean it's a disease process. That it's not caused by your um, uh, by your uh, plant milk intake. But keep an eye on PubMed. Anything pops up, let me know, and I'll do a video about it. Yes. Hello, and thank you for doing what you do. You're welcome. Um, Recently, myself and my husband had our CIMT stuff, mm -hmm. and yeah. we're clear. Awesome. Woo hoo! High five. Yeah. Thank Her you. Her arteries look good. Yes. And the tech who did this, the ultrasound, that's all she does is travel around. And as part of her routine, she scans the thyroid. There's a little bit more background. Both of our TSH is great, T3 free, T3 4, you know, all of that is good except my husband has uh, 3.7 for a uh, white blood cell count, a little bit low. And no, not low. Did you see my videos? I did, but how low is too oh, low? So four is like ideal. Didn't you have what the study showed? Yeah. So you're like, nailed it. Okay. So I mean, just- Well, you know, I'm 12, you're plant, whole food plant-based vegan, and I'm at six. Okay, I so that's, that's so that's relative. So just but that wasn't my question. Just a, just a pause, and I'll <laughs> inform everybody and get back. So no, no. So um, you know, one of the common things people go blood based, they get their blood work done to like show off to all their friends, and their doctor says, "Oh, your white blood cell count is low, right?" Um, uh, and they view that as a bad thing because the only time they've ever seen that little inflammation in the body. Um, uh, is because they have some uh, they have some disease where their bone marrow is, is not producing enough white blood cells. But actually, that is the ideal blood count based on uh, populations with the lowest disease rates, based on plant-based eating populations. And the white blood cell count is a sign of inflammation. You want low, so I think four was perfect. So anyway, so that was great. But anyway, yeah. So I mean, low white blood cell is good. If you have higher, then you have some source of inflammation. Um, and you should uh, find it and root it out. Yeah, lucky him. He, he's fish twice a month and, and some oil too. Um, but uh, so while she's doing the scan, she scans the thyroid and finds a, a, a fluid filled cyst on mine and a nodule on his and basically says everybody she sees has one of these. And so my question is, why? What's the cause? What do we do about it? Do we need iodine? She says 85% are benign. Um, and uh, you don't look at the first place, right? You don't do anything for incidental thyroid nodules um, unless they have these particular characteristics that presumably they would have uh, uh, picked up on. So basically, the reason, so if you've been watching my mammogram series, there's this something called overdiagnosis. Um, and that is the greatest harm associated with cancer screening. Um, and that's the concern that you would pick up something um, that was cancerous but would never within your lifetime ever even be symptomatic, you never even know you have it, but you're treated as a cancer patient, chemo, surgery, radiation, et cetera, which may increase your risk of death because of all the, the treatment. Um, and, and so for example, if you do, if you look at car accidents, so young women, women in their 30s, um, I forget what the stats, like one in four women in their 30s die in car accidents, have little breast tumors. They, uh, and you say, wait a second, one in four women don't die from breast cancer, um, so, 
a lot of those, in fact, most of those never would have occurred. So thank God we didn't find them um, during their lifetime because it never would have caused them any problems and they would have been treated like a cancer patient. That number goes up. Prostate cancer, most men by, I forget, well, certainly by 70 have these tiny cancerous prostate tumors. We don't want to find them because for most people, they'll die with their tumors and from their tumor. Um, and they can go through all sorts of horrible treatment for it unnecessarily. And in thyroid cancer, it's nearly 100%. So if you actually do a close enough slice, uh, by the time um, we are elderly, like between 98 and 100% of people actually have thyroid cancer, but you don't do anything for it because, because actually dying from thyroid cancer is extraordinarily rare. Um, and so in the vast majority of cases, or over diagnosis, so you just don't want to pick it up because then you worry about it and there's nothing to worry about. So you don't do anything for incidental, um, so if your TSH is fine, your thyroid function is fine, that's what we're Right. Eight minutes. Okay. Dr. Gregor? Yes. First of all, I want to thank you for running nutritionfacts.org. You should be awarded a Nobel Prize for oh. all that. I have a question on vaccinations. I think the pharmaceutical industry is in bed with FDA and CDC because in 1987 they were mandatory only 11 vaccines. In 2017 they have mandated 67 vaccines and they sell the CDC purchase those vaccines from the pharmaceutical industry at a net worth of 2.4 billion dollars and they have made it mandatory from the since the child is born up to age 18, and even to a very newborn infant, the vaccination is given where he doesn't have a full developed immune system. And then the next question is for the Gardasil vaccine, they promoted that saying, this is to prevent ovarian cancer in teenage girls. So, so why is it promoted, why is it made mandatory to be given to boys now? <laughs> because they don't want to give the women cervical cancer and female cancer as well. But, and beyond that, the pharmaceutical companies are actually protected from liability. Like, they can't be right. sued for a vaccine. Okay. Um, uh, the, that's the problem with the corrupting influence of commercialism within medicine. You don't know. Um, when a medical association comes out, like the radiologists come out and say we should be mammogramming women starting at age 40 every single year until 70, is that because that's what the science says? Or is that because the organization, the, the study is funded by General Electric? Or in fact, the whole journal is funded by, in fact, the whole field is funded by the mammogram machine man manufacturers. So you don't know, it's this billions of dollars um, uh, uh, influencing or is that what the actual science shows? And that's why nutrition facts that exists, right? It's that because you need to be able to see, because there's contradictory science. And so wait a second, is it contradictory science because it's, you know, there's tobacco industry funding, and that's why some science, some science says cigarettes are bad or even good for you, neutral even good for you, versus those that show it's bad for you, or is that there actually is some uh, real science here? And so that's why someone needs to just dig through the tens of thousands of hours and, and come out. Okay, so actually that is, you will see, I've got my vaccine folder. Let's see how many articles we have in that vaccine folder. Uh, now B, that's way at the end of the year. There's no way we'll get into that for a while, I'll tell you. Um, oh, that's under controversial non-nutrition topics. Controversial non-nutrition topics. So like dental amalgam, circumcision, fluoride, Lyme disease, chronic Lyme disease, testosterone, tongue brushing, tongue brushing. All right, here's my vaccines. We have, um, oh, um, it's calculated. There's so many articles there, we're just calculating. So here's all my vaccine articles. Um, and I, as soon as I get to there, I'm going to go through. Oh, here's all my HPV stuff, the Gardasil that you recommended. Um, all the safety assessments, and I will go through and find out what the truth is. But in general, the greatest thing the medical profession has ever done in the history of humanity was the elimination from the face of the earth of smallpox, which killed literally hundreds of millions of people. That was done thanks to vaccines, one of the greatest things that the medical mind, that the human mind has ever come up with. The single greatest thing was a vaccine. 
Um, and we should be we should be very happy that we're not dying from this month, you know, et cetera. But are any particular new NAT vaccines or benefits outweigh the risks? We should be fully informed as to the as to the benefits and risks, and I will do that in my series. And until then, you follow the CDC recommendations. And if you go on your PA website, it says clearly like a four ounce of fish would contain so much mercury parts per million. And in, when the independent labs have tested for each single vaccine that uh, CDC promotes, there are 207 percent more mercury in those vaccines of thermosol and formaldehyde. And they're right, but they're right, and, and we're more concerned about the mercury in vaccines because you're actually injected, whereas in fish there's bioavailability issues. You may actually poop out some of the mercury in fish, whereas if you inject it, you're going to hold on to all that mercury. There's really no safe intake of mercury, but thimerosal, this mercury preservative vaccines, has been removed from essentially all childhood vaccines, and even flu vaccines. You can get individual vials to get pregnant. Um, you can tell your doctor you want the pregnant. Pregnancy, um, flu vaccine, they'll get you a single vial so you don't need preservatives. The only reason you have, you know, is because you have a big thing of vaccines, keep sticking needles in it for new people, and so that's why you have to have a preservative. But if you have single use vials, don't need preservative, no mercury, you can get your flu shot without, uh, so yeah, just tell, tell them you're pregnant. <laughs> I do. I do. I say, I, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. <laughs> Dr. Greger, so my question has to do with mm -hmm. severe brain concussion, the dizziness, vertigo, slow speech, head bobbing, bouncy gait, and when uh, stimulated with the eyes, nausea and dizziness returns. Currently being treated with physical therapy to make um, the crystals go back in the right place in your head and speech therapy. What do you recommend? All right, don't play football. That's the answer to right. Um, uh, is there any dietary intervention for head trauma, speeding head and trauma recovery? I don't know. Um, uh, so I would assume you would want to, you know, eat particularly brain healthy foods um, uh, and improve uh, improve uh, vascular blood flow to help remove toxins, help uh, you know brain nutrients and oxygen, etc. And so it's this whole book. But have lots of berries and greens, all these brain foods, walnuts. Um, but it's never been put to the test that we split people up with traumatic brain injuries, even if it does, as far as I know. And so um, it's just never been looked into before, unfortunately. But eating a healthy diet can only help. That's the nice thing about eating healthy is that you, regardless of what else you do, even if there's no study that shows anyway, well, you want to be healthy anyway, and the last thing you need is a traumatic brain injury and a heart attack or and a stroke. Ah, so you might as well eat healthy, and maybe you'll have um, insulin benefits. Sure, absolutely. We are down to two minutes, um, and I do want to thank the gentleman for um, uh, appointing nutrition facts at work. We are very excited to, we actually have two of our staff. Anybody? Um, uh, get to meet uh, Stephen and Dustin here on the trip to the Big Nutrition Factor of Art. Um, if you uh, have a chance, I'm really excited to bring them. And thanks to the um, uh, cruise uh, organizers to allow me to, uh, to offer to bring them on um, so they could uh, share the wisdom with everybody. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we're like the Wikipedia model where everything's free, no ads, you know, not selling anything, but we just reach so many millions of people that if one, one of the thousand people kicks in a few bucks, then we pay everyone's salaries and we can do all the work we're doing. Um, and if anyone wants to help us, we can do it. Yes? Hi, thank you for this opportunity. Um, my wife was diagnosed with stage three primary biliary cholangitis. Yeah. Two, a little over two years of a plant-based diet have halted the progression of the disease. Nice. Enzymes stabilized and whatnot. Love it. Is there any hope for completely reversing it? So anytime, so anytime you hear a disease with the itis at the end, right, that means inflammation, right? And so it makes sense that an anti-inflammatory diet might help. Um, the question is, the problem with that disease is that the scarring that occurs. And once you have this kind of fibrotic scarring, that doesn't go away. We don't tend to, uh, you know, kind of revert. You can't reverse scarring. So, like cirrhotic livers, um, if uh, you know you have so much inflammation in your liver from the, from the hepatitis that it gets scarred up with cirrhotic, the only thing you do is a liver transplant, essentially. Um, and so, but what you did was, add, I mean, you, you get on the healthiest diet as possible, slow down the progression as much as possible. But um, unfortunately, any damage that has been done is not likely to reverse if it's going to destroy tissue. I would like to thank Dr. Greger for giving us a sneak peek behind the curtain of the Nutrition Facts of Life. It's been massive. And thank you for reading all of those studies. So, we will go out.